Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the We Can Do This podcast, Kiss the Ground's weekly conversation about how we can participate in healing our earth and healing ourselves as we are one in the same. My name is Rylan Englehart. I'm going to be your host today. And uh, really, uh, it's a, a huge honor and privilege uh, coming into the month of May, uh, Mother's Day coming up. And we were thinking about the theme for May and really what came up was how to honor mothers. And uh, then the first thing that came into my mind was how can I honor uh, one of my mothers who is here with us today, Teresi Engelhart. Um, she's been uh, my stepmother, been my mother uh, for the last 17 years, 18 years. And um, yeah, it's just uh, such an honor to have you on the podcast uh, to hear your story. And we know each other, we're family, but it's actually interesting that we can learn a lot from each other, even those that we know so well when having uh, new conversations or conversations in front of other people, uh, including our audience today. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Teresi, for joining us. I'm gonna just give a little bit of um, background of your bio. Uh, Again, uh, today's, the theme of today's talk is finding joy in sacrifice. And that just kind of emerged as an inspirational idea uh, because when thinking about mothers and what they represent and um, how they show up for um, everyone is that there's an element of sacrifice that always shows up. So, uh, and you've, you've, you've demonstrated being joyful through it um, in so many ways. <laughs> So yeah, Teresi Engelhart um, shares her calling uh, of people experiencing how loved they are. Um, so that is who she is. Um, she has an infectious joy. Um, she comes from a journey of sexual abuse um, and over 20 uh, years of an eating disorder. And that really empowers her sharing a real life experience um, and intimate relationship with an internal loving voice uh, that led to her healing. Um, and she has an inspiring new podcast called uh, Unreasonably Grateful. Um, and that's going to be a, there's going to be a book that's going to be following that up. Um, so check that out. And um, yeah, she's a teacher. She's a, a speaker. She's also uh, the wife of my father <laughs> and uh, lives on a, an amazing regenerative organic farm in Vacaville, California called Be Love Farm. And um, yeah, she also was the co-founder of Cafe Gratitude and Gracias Madre uh, plant-based restaurants. And she is the, um, the mother of five grown children and uh, 13 grandchildren. Um, <laughs> I, I, I moved to tears uh, by just, uh, yeah, reading and, and being connected to who you are. Um, and I just want to share a little bit uh, more, which is that uh, you know, one of, one of the most challenging uh, breakdowns in my life was, you know, the end of my nuclear family. Uh, at 20 years old, uh, my parents separated, and uh, I thought that was kind of the end of life. Um, and I couldn't imagine family without our family being together. And, you know, the, the miracle is that Tercy came into our lives, became my father's uh, new wife. And from that expanded our family, expanded the vision of our family's mission and world um, to the umpteenth degree. And so it's just a, another example of, um, yeah, surrendering and sacrificing our view of attachment to something and when we can uh, surrender and let go um, you know the miracle can unfold and you know just one of the always the most impressive things that communicates such profound uh, love of Tercy and our family is that my mom my biological mom um, had the opportunity of designing and, and creating the wedding dress of Tercy's to marry my father and so just kind of to set the context of um, 
who 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 Tercy is. Uh, welcome, Tercy Engelhart. Thank you for joining me this morning. So great to be here, Ryland. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, how, do, how does it how does how does it feel being on uh, your, one of your son's podcasts? <laughs> yeah, it's ex it's exciting. You know, it's like um, yeah, I feel like you. I'm probably getting to see you in a new way, and I love. I mean, we're all in the midst of something new unfolding, so it's perfect. It's wonderful. Mm, beautiful. Um, awesome. So I just, just to, to, to give people a little bit of context and in your world, uh, tell us where you are and what your morning chores were this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's see. I'm actually upstairs of the barn in, uh, at Bela Farm in Vacaville. And I I'm using my microphone and my earphones, my little podcast setup, which is awesome because I have a bookkeeper next to me working who comes on Wednesdays. And I got up at five and that's the time when I, I write my grandchildren. If there's something up and I need to support them, it's the time where I pray or meditate and study and sit quietly, connect, you know, with myself. And then after that, we do a campfire where we read something inspiring, check in with the farm crew, look at what the day is going to hold. And then I get breakfast started and then I head out and milk some cows. And today I made ricotta cheese because I'm doing pizzas for lunch and I'm catering a six person private dinner tonight uh, which is pizza. And then we had breakfast and then I made the pizza dough. And then I ran up here and asked dad to clean up the mi mixer bowl because I wasn't sure I was going to have enough time. So that's what my morning looked like so far. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Um, awesome. So uh, this is something that I have some understanding of. Um, but again, I, I think asking questions in, in front of new audiences has us learn things about people that we know and love and understand. But uh, your name, uh, Tercy's, uh, most people pronounce it wrong. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that there's any other Tercy's uh, in the world. Uh, tell us about your name and where it comes from. Um, yeah. And yeah, what it, what it, what it means to you. Okay, great. So um, there is one other Tercy, but it's a, it's a middle name. So they named, they named their daughter with the middle name of Tercy, but okay. So uh, after like, they met you or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> so um, as Ryland shared, I uh, came through sexual abuse at 16 and then I lived with an eating disorder from 16 to 36. And then I went into recovery at 36. So this is my 35th year of recovery. And early on in recovery, I, um, my recovery was really about regaining, rebuilding trust of my inner guidance. So um, how I actually went into recovery is actually a podcast coming up on Mother's Day called Mothers and Daughters. And I don't want to ruin that for you. I want to encourage you to listen to it. But it was my daughter who asked me a question. And that question created this opening in my awareness because I wasn't willing to pass on to her the same thing that I was experiencing, which was this break in trust with whatever you want to call that inner guidance, that inner wisdom, that still small voice. Um, and so that was the beginning of my journey. And early on in that journey, um, I heard, and sometimes how I hear is voice. Sometimes how I hear is it's just an impression. Um, it's hard to describe how you hear, you know, for me, it's God talking to you, but I was told to change my name and my birth name is Marsha. And I thought, I don't really want to change my name. I don't. I don't know anybody who's changed their name. Uh, my parents will be upset. Mm, I'm not a hippie. Like I couldn't come up with any good reason to change my name. 
And yet I also had learned that trusting that wisdom always led me further down the path of the life I was created and designed to live. So I, I remember we were in Mountain View, California, outside of Blockbuster, and I had the three kids in my car. And I said, hey, you guys, mommy's going to change your name. And they were like, oh, excited. And, you know, I said, I'm going to call myself Tercy. And it got really quiet. And then one of the kids said, well, what about Julie? And, <laughs> <laughs> and another one said, like, what about Christy? You know, I was like, no, it's not just any name. So, but they were great. They got on board. They were actually really supportive of my recovery process. And so Tercy, if you look at the way that it's spelled is if you go from backwards, it's spelled S-E-C-R-E-T, which spells secret. And I had lived, my abuse was a secret. I had lived, you know, multiple lies over those 20 years of addiction. Um, and so changing my name was about no longer keeping any secrets and a reminder. It was, you know, some people wear a necklace when they join, you know, a group or some people have stones or crystals or something like that, that reminds them of something. And so my name became the reminder of to be transparent, to be completely transparent and not keep any secrets. So while it did upset my parents and it took a while, um, it's been one of the most powerful things I ever did because every day someone usually asks me, where'd your name come from? Is that like French or what does it mean? And, you know, depending on uh, the environment and the relationship, you know, determines kind of what I say, how deep I go into the story, but it's just a constant reminder to not keep secrets, to be transparent. And it's, it's powerful. It means a lot to me. Mm. And how, uh, I don't, h how long did it take for your parents or your mother to, or did, or did she call you Marsha until she died? Until she died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was always Marsha to her, to her, in her view. I gave you that name. I like that name. That's the name I wanted. And that's the name I'm going to call you. But everyone else in my life, I mean, there's not, I'm older, so there aren't that many people left, but most people in my life now call me Tercy. No one calls me Marsha really. Maybe. I don't know, maybe some distant relative if I find him on Ancestry.com. <laughs> but yeah, everyone calls me Tercy. But it's been 30, 35 years. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So again, this is uh, this podcast and this month is really about honoring mothers. Uh, and uh, you are a, uh, you're a mother of five. Um, and yeah, I'd love to just hear um, some of your most precious and fulfilling moments of being a mother. Well, okay. So first of all, I was an addict through all of my children's births and much of their young years. So I would say while I always loved my children and I did a really good job of being there for them and with them, you also, again, good to remember that, you know, I now have a lot of, I have 13 grandchildren, so I've seen a lot of uh, mothers and young children just in my family. And, you know, lots of times uh, the daughters will ask me like, oh, what was it like for you? And I was like, well, you don't, you don't really want to know because <laughs> I wasn't, you know, when my children were very young, I was struggling with addiction. And which is also what the Mothers and Daughters podcast is about. So I would say, um, you know, I've always loved my children and I wanted to be a great mother and they inspired me in so many ways. They kept me going. You know, I had to get up the next day, get them to school, pack lunches. I was a single mom for a lot of years. Um, and, but I would say, Later on, like as my children grew, they were a great support, as I said earlier, for my recovery. They've always been, we've been great friends as well as uh, either parent and then my children. And we've been through a lot together. While we might have very different memories of the stories of what we've been through, we went through them together. And I would say that children actually are an opportunity to learn to put other people first. And um, 
you know, like I said, it was my daughter who really inspired my recovery. And I would say that was a moment when kind of the selfishness of addiction shifted to, I cared more about what I was passing on than uh, what I was living with. So, um, I, you know, for me, it's, it's children, it's community, you know, learning, learning to put the needs of other people before you is, is what I believe you're referring to when you talk about sacrifice. And as many years as I've been doing it, it doesn't really feel like a sacrifice anymore. It feels like it's a part of who I am. And there are other places where I feel the sacrifice more, but caring for children or grandchildren feels really like an honor. And maybe that's because of the early years where I was struggling with addiction as well, that now it feels, I mean, my favorite thing in the whole year is our family vacation where we all take a week and we spend time together. Um, yeah, I love, yeah, I love being with my family. Um, so I don't know. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. <laughs> um, and yeah, so just in, in the spirit of, um, what yeah how how would you express um sacrifice what does that what does that mean to you um yeah and and you, you kind of touched on it but just share a little bit more of how you view sacrifice um at a at a philosophical level as well as at, down to a, a practical in your life level so so that's changed over the seasons and the years, but how I would view sacrifice now is it's an opportunity to expand my capacity to love. So the question is, that's why I think I don't see it as sacrifice because if I see it as sacrifice, I think my attention would be on that I'm giving up something, but I see it as an opportunity to actually receive something. And that would be, the expansion or capacity to love deeper, further, more with less conditions, like moving more towards what ultimately I would say my, my goal is or the fulfillment of my mission, which is people experiencing how loved they are. Well, how do people experience how loved they are? They are in the presence of love. So presencing love is valuable to me. So the sacrifices that I might make are actually gifts and honors to practice loving in a place where perhaps I have some resistance or tension or, you know, I'm, I'm actually currently looking at this, these words, willing and, and free will. And I'm looking at, wow, like how much love in my case, God or the creator had to have to give us this species the only species, free will, knowing that sometimes we would just be unwilling mm -hmm. and yet love us so much to know that at some point, at some point we would hit, you know, the bottom or the end of the rope or our backs would be against the wall or however you express that, that sense of, I can't do this anymore. And then we would use that free will to become willing. So I think sacrifice loses the sense of sacrifice when you're willing. And I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to, um, yeah, I'm willing to go through the lesson to love deeper and more completely and less conditionally. So yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah. I'm, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm feeling weepy today, um, but I, I'm, I'm just present to um, how I've always seen you, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people who, you know, their upbringing or their, their disposition allows them to just kind of be kind of get in the front of the crowd and like speak their truth and like um and 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 you know step into a leadership role and what's so amazing and remarkable about about you is you know i know that that's not the the 
you know, that's, you know, you're kind of like the polite little girl who wanted to be, you know, good and, you know, sitting still and well behaved. Um, and yet through your lifetime, and from what I've seen, your willingness to, um, when there's an opportunity to stand up and to be courageous and to express something that even may not be popular or may not be, you know, what's wanting to be heard, but yet um, there's a willingness, you have a willingness and to stand for love um, in un, um, you know, in, in, in powerful ways. And I just, um, you know, I really, uh, I know that that is inherent in, in mothers, but I just, you know, specifically want to acknowledge you for, I've observed whether it's in a family dynamic or whether it's in a business dynamic or whether it's, um, you know, in business partners, um, just willing to uh, stand up and say, um, you know, it's not going this way, even mm -hmm. when, you know, you, you're, you're not the person always carrying or wearing the like, you know, I have the, <laughs> I, ha I have the torch when it's time to say I have the torch. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away and inspired by how you grab the torch and say, um, this shall be, um, and, and my voice will be heard, um, in this moment. So thanks Thank for, thanks for being that role model for, uh, me and for our family. Thank you. And I, I would say, Rowan, I think that, um, you know, addiction would be self-will run amok. And so I think what I'm, what I'm looking at and exploring right now is that that actually has an advantage when we realize that uh, self-will only gets you so far. And so the willingness to sacrifice or surrender um, is a more attractive trail right now. It's a more valiant path for me because I've tried the other one and it didn't lead where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that at a deep level. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess in, in I'd love to hear um, some, it, some places that you're finding your willingness uh, to where you're finding your willingness to sacrifice your own wants for um, some greater good and yet how you found or where you found uh, joy uh, there. Uh, you know, we, we as a family say there's no, there's no cheese down that tunnel, but <laughs> <laughs> there is cheese down the tunnel of sacrificing our, you know, precious I, will, me, my thing um, for, um, for an expansion, as you said, an expansion in the capacity to love or for love to be experienced and expressed and received. Mm. All right. Well, I'll just share with you like something that's current, which is, can you just have to stick with me because this, I don't know that I've put it in words this way. It might be a little bit of a, a little bit of a trail to follow, but okay, let's just look at, I'm just going to use you since I'm having a conversation with you. Let's just look at, you have something to apologize to me for, and you've done the work to see that there's something you want to apologize for. And again, let me just briefly share that for us, not just as a family, but as a community, how we distinguish apology is taking responsibility for the impact that you've had on another person, maybe something you did or didn't do, said or didn't say. It's not an assignment of blame or uh, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. It, it's not that. It's simply saying, wow, I can see my actions had an impact. So just, okay, set that aside. So you've apologized to me for something. And let's just say, I say I forgive you. But then I still have a conversation with myself that sounds like, but I never would have done that. Well, and I never, where, what were you thinking? Where were you coming from? Like, I might still have that conversation, maybe even with you, like, Rylan, yeah, I accept your apology. But like, what was going on? Where was that even coming from? Like, what had you even say that? Have you ever heard that when you've <laughs> apologized to someone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. You have, right? Because we do that. Well, what I saw... What I saw was if, an, uh, if forgiveness 
is true forgiveness, both people are set free. But if I'm still holding on to some version of, yeah, but I can't believe you did that, or really? Then I'm not free and you're not either. And in fact, I'm actually holding you hostage. And so I now have something to apologize for because I'm saying technically I'm better than you because the thought of, well, I would never do that. Why? I can't believe you did that. Where is that even coming from? All that is actually the flip side of I'm better than you because I would never have done that subtly. Mm. And so that's where I experience um, what, what, I, what we're calling sacrifice today, that looking at a deeper level of what's in the unsaid, what's even behind the conversations I'm having or, and then looking to see what's my responsibility in that. That's where I experience um, reducing my self interest or being more committed to freeing the other person than freeing myself and leaving them trapped or yeah. So does that make sense? That's, that's the kind of, work that I'm currently invested in, um, which is, yeah, how can I see my participation in a new way that frees all people, you, me, all of us? Mm. Yeah. So I guess that, that, that was beautiful. And um, I'm wondering, is there uh, an example in your life right now where you're you're feeling into uh, you're you're feeling into the place of freedom or pe feeling into the place of joy or liberation um, when you've really sacrificed the um, as you were describing that. Um, way of being that is um, sort of condemning or questioning or, you know, apologizing, but then not apologizing. Is there, is there, a, um, is there a place that you're currently experiencing the other side and the, the freedom or the joy that comes from making that sacrifice? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, so first of all, for me, it's, freedom is joy and uh, consciousness or awareness is, is love. I don't believe there actually is love without consciousness or awareness. And so constantly being willing to look at the unconsciousness, my own unconsciousness is what allows me to move closer to the awareness and the consciousness of love. So that, and that's, a victory for me. And that's not, there's great joy in that. The current situation is, um, you know, your dad, Matthew has been away for 10 weeks and virtually missed, you know, the whole COVID, whatever people are calling it, the global pandemic, the, the quarantine. I haven't been off the farm and uh, because of my age, I was one of the first ones quarantined or, so for a long time. And so there's obviously been this very different experience. He's been away on a spiritual retreat and I've been here running the farm as we, you know, closed down all of our restaurants, laid off collectively almost 700 people, like a lot, a lot's gone on. And so his re-entry a few days ago when he, you know, we've all been in quarantine and they've been traveling internationally and one of them actually, uh, they believe, had the virus. So there's been a certain amount of tension as they begin to re-enter. So there's been lots of opportunities for, you know, us to practice. You know, we can, we can all have these really high and beautiful and wonderful ideals, um, but then when the rubber hits the road, it's usually relational. It's usually in relationship where we get to practice them. And so, yes, I've had lots of opportunities to, um, you know, 
hear what he has to say, to express myself, to apologize to him, to have him apologize to me and to forgive. And yesterday I had seen that there were things that he had said to me that, um, you know, felt hurtful and mean and um, not, not what I, you know, obviously had some expectation, not what I expected upon his return. And that, I had said I forgive him, but I still was carrying around this residue of, I can't believe that's what you came back with, right? So, mm -hmm. so then when I sat down and shared with him what I had seen, certainly there was a, a freedom that was then available for both of us and the opportunity for us to move beyond that. And, you know, nothing, nothing excites me more or brings me more joy than people getting freed, of places in their life where they felt constricted or restricted or trapped or, um, I mean, the transformation of human beings is what inspires me most. So, yeah, I mean, that's a specific example. Um, I mean, and then there's, you know, and then there's while he was away, I started doing these goofy little farm videos and, you know, <laughs> I'm just sharing with okay, you. Okay, like, great. What's today's okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I do these farm videos where I take a farm chore that I'm doing every day and they've been brought into school systems and classrooms and online programs for kids because I basically show them something I'm doing on the farm each day. And I don't know, this personality, you know, this kind of goofy personality showed up that um, people are calling Mrs. Rogers, but it's really, I was just doing something that actually brought me joy and other people got joy out of it. So that's like a really magical, magical experience when you do something that you believe you're doing to gift or to give someone something, and yet it's bringing you great joy and it does bring them joy as well. So yeah, that's awesome and amazing. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of, and yeah, it reminds me of being in uh, in relationship with my wife and uh, <laughs> after 10 years and, uh, or nine years, coming on 10 years. Uh, and just, yeah, the, the, again, to the, to make the point of uh, finding joy in sacrifice, uh, this um, moment where there is a a perception and an and a, a disagreement of how we are approaching something, whether it's with the speed, with the style, with the um, you know cleanliness uh, of how we're doing something, and you know then feeling my wife in this case judging me or um you know telling me uh you know to do it differently and then finding seeing my resistance or you know don't tell me how to do this uh and then there's this there, there's you know not it's not it's not all the time that i can uh, get to this <laughs> but there's this moment where uh literally there's a, an ability to pop my own bubble called the resistance bubble and then it's just like oh back to love back to uh connection um but when i hold the tension of my resistance bubble then i'm i'm not i'm not finding joy and sacrifice but if i <laughs> pop my own bubble i am i'm actually back into relationship of love um and that's a a, a, a very acute uh expression of that uh, that what you're what you're sharing, and wouldn't you say to Rollin that part of the speed with which you can do that is the recognition and realization of how the other way goes? <laughs> yes, when you stand there and fight, it's like, what are you fighting for? Right? Usually, we're mm. fighting for, you know, I, way I think of it is why am I so committed to making someone I love wrong? right mm. or by simply being right mm. or you know the, the advanced version i'm just not gonna let her always get her way because she's not actually right right so you start to dig in i do mm. know how to do this yeah right? it's yeah. like i know how to do this i'm not giving up here right that's what we do we dig in yeah so great moment of 
does it really matter? Hopefully we've come out of this COVID experience with a clearer understanding of what really matters. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I'd love to, and you kind of touched on this already, and um, I would love, because I think we're all all healing, um, you know, we're all healing. That's kind of what it feels like this human ex experience is, is um, healing, healing back to wholeness. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, for, for people who, because I think we're all on a healing journey of some um, kind or another, um, what would you say were two um, milestones um, um, of your healing that, yeah, really um, could be anchors or things that people can um, go, okay, wow, I can see how, you know, again, we, we learn from other people. So, yeah, I'm just curious, like maybe two, two points or milestones in your healing journey that uh, feel uh, notable, palpable, and they, they hold um, some memory of like a, a transformation occurred there. And so by healing journey, are you talking about my 35 years? Or are you talking about the quarantine COVID experience? Um, you could go, you could go long timeline or short <laughs> timeline, whatever, whatever feels more relevant. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I would say, um, uh, okay, so there are some people, there are, will be people who are listening. There are people for whom giving up and sacrificing for others is a default and they actually have to learn how to value and care for themselves um, and so I would say, um, one of the things that I've learned for myself, I mean, it's been a, a part of the long journey, but it became really pronounced in this, uh, quarantine and COVID is to, to discover and value, uh, my own needs to not, I grew up kind of thinking if you had needs, you were needy and that was bad and that other people's needs had value, but not yours. So I would say one of the things that I learned through this was just to value my own needs and to care, to care for myself that I don't think I ever, because there was so much on my plate, I don't think I ever experienced, you know, just like in the airlines, when the oxygen masks come down, they tell mothers, put yours on first and then help your kids. So I don't think I ever had the physical experience of the importance of caring for myself so I could care for so many other people. I think in the past, I, I more cared for people and was depleted. And so that was really valuable to learning, learning that caring for myself, being able to identify and name my needs and then put the structures in place that I needed to care for myself allowed me to be much more effective at caring for other people. So I would say that is one of the big lessons. And mm. that- Yeah, I just wanted to reflect something because obviously this podcast, Kiss the Ground, oftentimes speaks uh, less about kind of the human psychological healing and more about ecological healing. And what I was hearing and seeing while you were saying that, you know, metaphor about, you know, which is such a great metaphor, about the, you know, we have to put on our, our oxygen mask first. I was thinking about the, the plant queendom, um, which, uh, you know, unless uh, a plant has been able to um, receive and uh, nutrients and water and sunlight, it actually isn't effectively a sacrificing gift to the, the the continuation of life or that those that might eat that thing so we we, we actually need to it's it's in in kind of an ecological lens we need to create healthy well-being you know bodied abled beings so that we actually um can be a um a, a substantial gift 
um, to others. But if we're frail, weak, and uh, not cared for, uh, we, we, we're less effective in our contribution um, to others. Well, yes. And, and I, I mean, I also would say that during this time where people have slowed down and gone more inward, and I, I'm not saying that's all people, but there certainly has been a chunk of it by just taking care of our own homes, staying in these environments, not traveling so much, less air travel, all of that. We've seen how the planet's begun to recover from our impact on it. Um, mm. And so, again, notice the planet's taking care of itself, mm. you know, and so I think it's super important. And you could look at that as also see that we have impact. And I think sometimes we don't live like we have impact, but we can see what's being revealed to us was always there. We just couldn't see it. So I would say the second thing I would say is slow down. Mm -hmm. um, I think people have begun to discover that what they were chasing and how quickly they were chasing it actually got in the way of ultimately who they wanted to be. So I think we've also become more aware of what we in Cafe Gratitude have been sharing for a long time is that the being is valuable and important and that when we nurture the being, the doing will roll out of that. And so I would say, yeah, slow down. And the more we do our inner, our inner work, for me, gratitude is obviously one of the principles of my life. The more we do that, the more powerful the choices that we make will be. And if we on this, in the Western, more developed world would spend more time in grace or gratitude or gratefulness or thankfulness, I believe that the choices that we make would be different because you can't be grateful without being aware. You can't be grateful without being conscious. And all things that miss the mark of love happen in the unconscious, attach themselves to the unconscious aspect of us. So the more we bring consciousness and awareness forward, the less we'll be falling prey to those actions and choices that actually kill something off rather than build or grow what it is that we're committed to. Mm. So those would be my two yeah, I, 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 I've, I've had this thought and expressed this idea and had this experience uh, of uh, moments of gratitude where the, 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 only, the only intention is um, how can I give this experience away? Yeah. How, how can I have others know yeah. this presence of love and fulfillment and gratitude yeah. as yeah. the only intention that it has. Yeah, because that's all there is when you're in that state. And so the more work we do to usher in and practice staying in that state, all the other things begin to unravel themselves and fall away. And I think that as we've slowed down as a global population, and we've begun to see the possibility of that. Now the question will be, as we enter into phase two or three or loosen up things, what are the structures we're going to put in place which are going to allow us to continue to, to stay with those lessons that we learned, those practices that we learned, so that we come out kinder, more generous, more patient, more loving, as the species, mm. Mm. we have a great opportunity in front of us. Yes, um, it's great. You, you kind of answered my, my next question was, uh, what, what connections have you seen as people heal themselves, how they relate to their healing relationship to the earth and how yeah. personal healing changed your relationship to the world around you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, you know, it's so great because you say even in the uh, promotion of this podcast, the earth and us one in the same. So, I mean, you can find every example of what our life looks like in nature. It's all there. 
And so when you think about um, how when we're more aware, we make different choices. It's like, you know, I'll just, I'll just look at my life personally, look at the years of addiction. All the choices I made as an addict were made out of the unconsciousness. So part of, part of my own journey is also forgiving myself in healing that. So how do I do that? Well, if we stay conscious, then we, then we exist in love. And you can even love those things that miss the mark of love for what they are. So that's the key. It's like unconsciousness is unconsciousness. You can Wait, even say, say, like, articulate that a slightly different way because I think that's beautiful, but I, I don't know that I captured so, it. So consciousness is love. There is no love without consciousness. And if you can be in pure consciousness, you can be in pure love and you would love everything. That's what I believe Jesus meant when he said, love even your enemies. Your enemy, one of the enemies for us as human beings who are given free will is unconsciousness. Unconsciousness is where all of the horrific things happen that we have a hard time understanding because we look at them through some conscious perspective. So if consciousness is pure love and pure love loves everything, then there's, it's even for us to love our shortcomings, where we fall short, where we miss the mark of love, which is the definition of sin, or where we do things that are, you know, mean or, you know, crazy or stupid or even, even evil, all that. But you love them for what they are, which is very different. Like, yeah, you get it. That's what it is. It's not like you don't, you don't love the person who abuses someone, but you can love abuse for what abuse is. And it's not that person. It's not, it's not, it's not the awareness that that person has or is. And that's, it's tricky. It's tricky to see, but that's what awareness is. So the more conscious we are, the choices we make will come from us being awake, us being aware, and they'll be very different than the choices we would make as wounded or hurt or damaged individuals who are living from some unhealed aspect of themselves or some unconscious aspect of themselves. Mm, thank you. And what would you say are some of the patterns um, that you've noticed about the healing journey. Um, yeah, what are, what are some patterns that you've noticed for yourself and for being a facilitator um, and working with people who are, you know, dealing with all the challenges? Like what, yeah, what, what are some of the high level patterns that you've seen over time as far as um, the recovery journey? Well, I would say initially, obviously, um, you know, and, and you just to, to, put in, you said, you know, kind of, we have this time for retrospection, pause. It's about putting in the infrastructure or the structures to support that. So that you could speak to that inside of the patterns too. So, yeah. So I would say, you know, one of the, one of the first things is to really begin to recognize where your self will has run amok, right? So that's bringing awareness to, the unawareness where you've relied only on yourself and it's got you where you are and where, you know, in the 12 steps, that's like admit that you are powerless. Like the mm -hmm. self will begins to crumble away and you recognize you need some power greater than yourself, which I believe we all have. We all, we don't have to go anywhere to get that. We all have that. You know, I was reading this morning around the campfire, another, another story that represented what we call acknowledgement, which is constantly calling out the best. And when you do that, that arises. So the same is, that's a powerful tool. So when we recognize that we have inside of us some wisdom, some unconditional love, some divine expression, when we give up letting our self-will run our run our life, which would be what you were calling earlier, the me, 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 my, 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 some egoic expression that puts you in the forefront. 
then that's the first step. You have to recognize, oh, it's not just about me. Uh, that, that's the beginning. And I've kind of messed up, messed it up being that it's about me. So I think there's humility. Humbleness is necessary on the path. And then I would say, you know, to repair um, relationship and connection, you have to recognize that you get to recognize. It's actually, I think, healing is an honor. We get to recognize that uh, it, it, we're not in this alone that we're a part of a bigger picture and there are a lot more people uh, in our lives that we've impacted and that are a part of that and begin to, you know, reach out and connect and repair broken relationships and rebuild new ones. And then I would say um, it's really important to just stay present, to not, not look too far forward and not look too far behind. That's the, it's the presence where the awareness exists. And then I think, loving other people and being willing to receive love. You know, those are two very different challenges to love other people and to be able to receive love because oftentimes the reception of love bumps into or hits some uh, lack of value, lack of worth, particularly in people who have um, are on a healing journey who are recovering from something. So it takes a while. That's a, that's a process to begin to soften a heart and to begin to be able to feel worthy of receiving how loved you are. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Let's see. We got, we got nine more minutes. I got a couple more questions. Um, So, uh, you know, kiss the ground, obviously we've, been kind of in a focus of regeneration as a context. Um, regeneration also could be called healing. Um, and again, you live on a uh, an amazing, amazing um, regenerative farm called Be Love Farm. And just, yeah, I'd love to just bring in kind of what do you, um, what do you see as what, what does that mean to you living um, a regenerative life or um, participating in regeneration? What does that uh, mean to you um, as um, yeah, a practitioner farm girl, as you call yourself? Uh, also, um, you know, someone who's a, um, on, been on a healing journey and, and, and offering uh, guidance and healing support to others. Well, I think, you know, if I, if, for myself, when I think about regenerating, it, I would say for me, it means that, uh, what, what, that there's a give and a take, that there's a constant cycle of give and take, that there are things that, there are things that die, whether it's plants or animals, or there are things that die that their death gives something back. And so I would say I'm always looking for, is this just taking or is this also giving back? And I would say I look at that both from a philosophical and a internal kind of life choices, life options. And then I also look at it from the physical, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual. It's like, is it taking or is it taking and returning something? Mm. Um, yeah, I would say that's, and, and being able to identify what's the take and what's the return. I think it's important to be able to identify that. I mean, how amazing is it that, um, I mean, like I said, when you look at the impact that's happened on the planet as people who have just taken less for really a very short period of time. Mm. Yeah, and how much, how much we're seeing uh, the earth renew, heal, and regenerate. Um, yeah. So if you look at that at a personal level, if, if you're in relationships where your experiences, people are just taking, mm-hmm. that's not a regenerative relationship if you mm-hmm. feel depleted. But then you also want to look at who am I being that is sustaining this relationship? And what is it I maybe am not saying or doing or what that that's, that's the regeneration. 
is you know today today's today's um, okay great okay to great today uh, let's give away what we want to receive so think about something you want to receive be really clear name it identify it and then go give that away to somebody okay great mm. that's regeneration. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Teresy dropping wisdom bomb. <laughs> uh, I remember, um, I remember a beautiful moment um, where we were together uh, and um, we were doing some deep healing work, some meditation work, some breath work, and um, we were, uh, you know, I was at the time, you know, missing my father. I wanted my father. And I remember you saying, um, who is your father for you? Um, and I remember saying, you know, he's supportive, he's loving, he's, um, you know, he's generous. And I remember you saying, yeah, so it's, it's your time to be that. You get to be that which you're looking for. You get to choose yeah. it and, and be it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was always... Um, yeah, it's another expression of regeneration. Um, you know that uh, I'm wanting something from somewhere, um, and actually I can regenerate it actually internally, um, such that it's it's present. Um, it's no longer missing. Yeah, it's no longer it's no longer missing. And consider that the awareness that it's missing is the indication that it's yours to give. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, let's see, we have, um, I have one more question. It's <laughs> kind of my signature question uh, of the We Can Do This podcast, which is, um, you know, we, we are that we can do this. Um, and my question to you, Teresi, is how? Well, I would say, <laughs> you're going to love this. I've been thinking, how come he's not saying we can be this? So that's how I would say how, mm. by, be, by being this, by, mm. being, by being it. Mm. Mm. How we can do this is by being it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Love it. Wow. So beautiful. And now we, we have two questions from our audience. Uh, how do you decide what foods you're going to cook every day on the farm? Cute. Okay. <laughs> and then how long uh, have you had Be Love Farm and how long have you been integrating regenerative practices? So we've had Be Love Farm for about 14 years now. And we started out kind of biodynamic and then permaculture. I mean, I would say it's always had a regenerative element to it, but I would say the awareness and the kind of deep commitment and consciousness of it and calling it regenerative uh, has probably been, I don't know what, right? Eight years. Yeah. yeah. Eight years, something like that. And so I only eat in season. So we don't, we don't buy anything that we grow. So we eat what's in season. Right now we're eating kale. We're eating a lot of beets. We're eating a lot of beet greens. We're eating strawberries, which is great. We're at the tail end of our citrus. So we eat seasonally. And that's how we determine what we eat. And we feed, you know, anywhere between 8, 10, and 20 people two meals a day. So we grow a lot of food, but yeah, we eat whatever is in season. Like I love melons, but I don't have melon at the 4th of July because we don't have melons here until late August. So we eat watermelon in August. <laughs> Does that wow. answer your question? That is beautiful. So let's see. Um, let's see a couple more things. Um, well, yeah, one, I just want to end with a, um, a huge heartfelt acknowledgement of just like, I love and adore you. And, you know, I so honor you as, um, one of my mothers and, uh, yeah, I so honor you for loving my father and, uh, being his partner on his journey. And yeah, thank you for, uh, raising such amazing kids and being such a grandmother, amazing grandmother. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, I, yeah, I honor you. Thank you. Um, and then let's see. Um, yeah, just uh, 
for those that are listening, thanks for um, <laughs> allowing me to express my uh, emotions and tears and feelings. And, uh, it's great. I love it. Grateful to be, gr- grateful to be a crier. <laughs> I know I'm alive. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. For those that um, are watching and support Kiss the Ground, we're a you know, nonprofit and uh, we've inside of COVID, we made our membership program available for as low as $1 a month. So if you can afford $1 a month, we highly recommend everyone becoming a member. And, um, and then, you know, it's, uh, we're coming into International Compost Awareness Week, which again, as uh, human beings, one of our great ways of participating in regeneration is composting, steward everything that comes off our dinner table back into the cycle of life, into the cycle of nature. And we launched the compost story, um, I think three years ago today, or yeah, this week. And I think over two to three million people have seen the video. And we're encouraging everybody to share uh, the compost story again because it's it's timeless and relevant. And you know, we we need uh, our participation more than ever in um, everybody participating in composting and stewarding. Uh, you know that piece of nature uh, back to the earth and not putting it in the landfill. So thank you. Um, we do this every Wednesday. This is a every Wednesday live podcast next week. Um, again, in honor of Mother's Day, we have uh, Donica Market Guard, um, one of the stars of the Kiss the Ground film, an amazing regenerative rancher um, from the Bay Area, managing 5,000 acres of land. Um, just amazing woman. And then the following week, we have Marion Williamson, um, also a mother and a powerful, you know, luminary. So keep on tuning in. And um, yeah, the last thing I just wanted to share, which again, this is um, from my mother, my biological mother, uh, Jean Angelhart. Um, you know, she sent me something a few years ago, which was a, um, the Mother's Day proclamation. Um, which was written in uh, 1870. And it was um, in response to uh, the Civil War and um, just being appalled by um, how we, um, as men, those that were fighting in the war, just, you know, just the brutality and um, destruction of war and basically called for mothers to come together um, and stand for peace um, from all backgrounds, all religions, all walks of life um, that she was. Um, and that then um, inspired another woman and that, that kind of turned into somewhat of the hallmark Mother's Day that we have today. Um, but again, uh, really mothers, I don't know, I think, I think the Dalai Lama also said it that, um, you know, in this era, it's going to be uh, mothers really standing up and um, their love and compassion and strength um, showing us a new way of how we interact with each other in the world. So honoring, honoring mothers, honoring Julia Ward Howe and um, the Mother's Day Proclamation. You can read that block proclamation in the uh, show notes of this, uh, of this podcast. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we love and appreciate you. It's been another great week of uh, tears and laughter and uh, and <laughs> sacrificing. Uh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> um, so finding joy and being okay with my tears and laughter. Um, and uh, Terrace, love you. I look forward to seeing yeah, you. Yeah, I love you, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, thank All you right. so much. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.